she always made space for me to mourn my disappointment. You know, it was never like, oh, if you only knew what I went through. You know, she right, said, right. No, this, this is a hard thing for you. But that being said, basketball is wins and losses. That was life and death. So for me, I do look at her and I do look at my dad, you know, you know, being fleeing his homeland as a refugee, coming to America, all those things. Like it gives you a sense of perspective. So I think it was healthy for me to, to have the motivation and the inspiration, but also to have the perspective. You're also a f- maniac. The training. Yeah, thank you for that. The I was training, waiting for that. <laughs> the training. This is a training podcast. This is probably the only interview you're ever going to be asked in this much detail about what you did afterwards. You, you did some crazy stuff, man. Like, can you can you yep. tell our our training adjacent audience what you did on those sand hills and and let Chris just be horrified at the things that you put your body through? Yeah, w- without a doubt. And so, uh, thank you for calling me a maniac because I take it as a compliment. But what that really <laughs> means, know. right? is that I, I was I was motivated and determined and I would put the work in. Welcome into the Train with the Best podcast. I'm Craig Hoffman. Chris Gorez. And we have a great show for you today. Our guest is going to join us in just a few minutes is Dan Grunfeld, The book is called By the Glory of the Game. It's his family story. Um, His dad, Ernie Grunfeld, longtime NBA player, longer time NBA executive, and his grandparents were survivors of the Holocaust. And that is Ernie, uh, his dad, is the only NBA player that can say that, Um, came over as an immigrant. It's a truly American immigrant story. And then his life story and his own athletic career that followed his dad is fascinating. The book is beautifully written uh, and was really excited to catch up with Dan about it. So that is the crux of our episode today, obviously coming up in just a few minutes. And next week, Chris, it's episode 200. That's right. I can't, I can't believe we're coming up on that. I mean, that's still, that's still a number that's mind boggling to me that we've done this for, for that long. And um, I, I guess good enough to keep going, right? If we, if we were bad <laughs> at this, we wouldn't have gotten to 100. So um, yeah, this has been quite a ride. In many ways, it's it's crazy to think not just where we were in zero to one hundred, but how far we've come from one hundred to two hundred, including right. uh, obviously all the YouTube stuff we've been doing lately. Uh, make sure that you're subscribed to Train with the Best on YouTube. Just search us. Uh, we've got podcast clips. We've got some new coaching demos. We've got the full podcast. Um, you know, I, I think a great way to listen sometimes, like if you're just looking for a a, a different way, you don't want to just like have your phone out on the table, like. Pull up your YouTube app on your smart TV, click on the podcast, let the thing roll the entire time. You don't even have to watch like, yeah, we're here. You can wave, say hi. Like right. we can, we can do that, but like yeah. you can just listen to the podcast kind of off your TV in the background as you work during the day. So especially with everyone working from home now. So right, that's right. tons of stuff and the continued evolution of our YouTube page is, is, a, is a work in progress. So make sure you're subscribed. That way you don't miss a thing. Also, if you're not subscribed to the podcast, you just check out episodes every once in a while. You got to search us. It's, There's an easier way. Subscribe. The podcast will come to you. Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever it is that you get your podcast. Hey there. Past future me again. We met a couple of episodes ago. You know, I periodically show up to make corrections on the podcast, like when I can't count. This is episode 198. So as beautiful as that sentiment was, episode 200 will be in two weeks. Great episode next week, 199. Why do we love round numbers? I don't know. Maybe that one will be super special. We do have the superstar mailbag. It's just it's just in two weeks. Okay, back to past future us on on episode 198 of, of this here podcast. Chris, we'll start the, the show today. We're recording this part of the show on Friday, uh, March 25th. Uh, I guess it was overnight or late last night. Um, Louis Simmons passed away. An absolute titan legend of the industry founder of west side barbell um i right. saw you actually i i found out uh when i saw your post on, on instagram um it, it, for people especially younger trainers who might not be as familiar maybe like they've heard of west side barbell but don't understand the history like how would you explain to someone who louis simmons is and what he means to the strength conditioning world um you know I, i'm very cautious of the word inventor or or founder because you know like look like human movement is is the same as human movement has been for thousands of years right so it's not like you founded or invented an exercise or a movement right, right. but 
you know, Louis was a, a true pioneer, I would say, in, in some of the philosophies that still hold a lot of water today. Like a lot of people follow his conjugate method. And, you know, uh, Westside Barbell was, was the birthplace of things like Wendler's 531 program, which is something that we follow. And, and, and like almost everybody now, when you look at the science and you look at strength and, strength and conditioning programs all around the world, there's some variation or some form of his conjugate method or, or the West Side Barbell stuff in everybody's strength program. Um, and he was he, he was a, a pioneer, I would say. I, I'm comfortable saying the word pioneer because he, he was one of the first to put it out there, be unapologetic about his philosophies and say, no, this is the way to do it and we're, we're not going to do it any other way. And, you know, like I think that uh, for a lot of people who are just getting into the industry, if you don't know about West Side Barbell, um, a lot of the strength programs that you do follow probably came from there. Right. Yeah. That's that's, that's, how, that's, that's what I was going to say is like, yeah. even if you think you don't know anything about West Side Barbell, you do. You just don't know that it came from West Side Barbell and specifically yeah. from Louis Simmons. Yeah. Even like the, the, the use of um, dynamic lifts. Right. Like the use of chains and bands and, and the use of different styles of bars. Right. Like the conjugate method was all about maximum effort. Right. Uh, it, for those who are not familiar with the conjugate method, it's. You, you do your, your main lift, which is your deadlift, bench, and squat, and you do a heavy max effort day, and then you do a dynamic day. So you have four workouts a week, right, on, on, on all of those things. Um, and that's where a lot of that, a lot of that stuff, like using um, accommodated strength with bands, using chains, using different types of bars, like the hex bar, using a, um, a safety squat bar, like a lot of that stuff has what was, uh, a thought in Louis Simmons' mind, and then it became a reality. So, um, yeah, we, we, we owe a lot to him. And, you know, I think, uh, yeah, he, he, he's definitely somebody who has had a lot of influence in the industry for, for, like you said, for a lot of people who don't even know it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what percentage of my knowledge goes back to him um, because I've learned it second and third hand, but I know that a lot of it does. And, you know, I, I think that even the idea of, like periodization and, and, and like having a method, right? Like having a plan, um, in that formulaic of a way, like they were one of the first ones to not like people have had plans and strength training for, since they've been picking up rocks, uh, on some level, you know, but it, it, to really have like kind of a, I, I'm trying to think of a better word, but and maybe you can help me out on, on, on the language here, but like almost like a mass produced type of thing. Like they were some of the first ones to really formalize that, to really put it out there and be like, no, this is how we do it. This is our method to, to market it is that too. And that was, you know, something that obviously gained popularity is some people who trained there went throughout the country and, and took that conjugate method and uh, some of the other things that they thought of there and, and took it to other gyms, but also was something that brought people to West side barbell. It was something that made West side barbell a Mecca. Like, you know, if you've trained at West side barbell, like that's something you like, yeah, I got to, I got to work out there. Right. Once. like, that's a badge right. of honor. That's like a, sure. a, a, a thing in the industry that if, I mean, I would love to go out there and, and be like, yo, this is the spot. Like this is, this is where it all started. Um, th this place is legendary. And look, look, to, to, to be honest with you, like if, if you have a weight room and you have dumbbells or barbells or kettlebells or, or some type of like specialty bar in there, it, it most likely came from Westside Barbell because like Sorenex and a lot of those companies like Sorenex went to Louis and was like, hey, what do you need? What, what are the things that you're working on and how, how do we make it? How do we make it for you? Like, what would you use? What would you not use? Right. So a lot of the stuff that you see that's out there, a lot of it was was made at West Side. Yeah. And, and I think the you hear a place called like West Side Barbell and it sounds like this like <laughs> meat head, whatever. And obviously, as we, we just talked about like a lot of science based stuff that's, you know, been proven and held up over time, whether it was initially done with like calculators are initially done with feel and then later justified by science like it holds it's good um but I, I think that that unlike some gyms with certain methods that are that have become popular or, or some of these methodologies that even if taken off on you know in the online world like my sense I, I don't have any personal connection to there but like my sense of everything that I've seen, everything that I've read, everything I've ever heard about West Side Barbell and specifically Louis Simmons is that like, he was a very inclusive person. Like, I don't, I don't want to speak out of turn. So for all I know, I'm going to read something and be like, that was a dumb comment. But like, <laughs> in terms of bringing in coaches, like there's so, and I guess that's kind of what I mean, right? Is like, there are so many coaches from so many different parts of the industry that are today, you know, on Instagram, 
posting up their story with Louis Simmons. Like they had a chance to have him either coach them in person or like meet with them when they went out there or like he was a guy who would do the occasional like podcast and things like that. And so um, I, th- I think that when you're kind of an OG of an industry, when you're someone who's that yeah. highly respected, you can go one of two ways. You can either isolate and be like, I am king sitting on high, or you can be accessible and try to spread your knowledge. And obviously that's the the method we would endorse. Um, and, and the fact that he did that, the fact that he was willing to spread his knowledge uh, is clearly made a huge impact on the industry because you see the trickle down of how many different pieces of the West side barbell method have made their way into other forms of training and been adopted and maximized. And, and obviously as you, as you started uh, talking about this, I think there's a great phrase, like they've held up over time. Yeah, exactly. And the, and the reason why they've held up is because like, you know, a lot of, a lot of their methods and, and the, the, the periodization protocols that they, they followed, a lot of that stuff was was proven, right? Like before they start putting that stuff out there, it, it's prove it, right? Like, all right, Wendler, you got a five three one program, prove it. What's the what's the methodology behind it? And at the very least, if it didn't work, they could at least explain to you what they were trying to do, what the thinking was behind it, and, and most of the time, it was going to work, right? So, um, yeah, it, it's uh, again, like I think that a lot of what we do in the industry today ha- has come from West Side and. You know, uh, a true leader in the field, and we'll definitely miss him. Yep, uh, died yesterday as we're recording this Thursday evening at the age of seventy-four. Um, yeah, just a, a pretty, pretty remarkable life and career uh, in terms of the, uh, a fitness legend. Um, anything else that we wanted to touch on real quick before we get to the interview with Dan? Yeah, I mean, just some personal stuff, man. I think um, you know. It, as I as I'm getting back out there for the people who are following me on social media, you guys know I've been putting some stuff out there, just kind of having some fun with having some fun with some of the characters that I've met, some of the characters that I portray sometimes, depending yeah. on what mood I'm in, right? Like a lot of the a lot of the stuff that's out there is just me making fun of myself and and some of the different personalities that I take on. Um, you know, even, even the conversations that I kind of have with myself. When when I'm designing a program or yeah. thinking about what music to play in the gym or stuff like that. Um, and, and you know, the other, the other thing I've been doing lately is just really just digging into my kids, man. Cause one of the things that I was able to do when I was able to kind of take a step back from training so much was reprioritize everything. So when I came back into, um, getting busy again, I wanted to make sure that, Hey, I'm not going to fall into the same traps that I did before. And I want to make sure that I'm spending time with the kids and digging into them, leading into some of the stuff that they do. And I've even posted some stuff. I think I, I posted something to Bree yesterday, jumping on the yeah. box and she was so happy to get up on there. <laughs> she was um, that I felt like that moment for a five-year-old was like one. her celebration said that if she hadn't made that and she fell over, there were tears that were going to be happening. Yeah. Well, so she had tried it like a few times. She 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 had been trying for about an hour to to, to jump on there, and I finally I was like, "All right, look, I'm not going to let you stop because I know that you can do this. You're just scared of doing it, so mm. I'm going to record you. Here it is." And then I started the recording, and I think that's where you hear my voice. Like, we're not moving on. She had asked to move on. I said, "We're not moving on. You're going to do this now, right?" Mm. Um, so she she got on there, and just the, that pure rawness of her, her of her joy, like when she screamed it, and when she jumped up on that box was. <laughs> It, it was fun to see, and, and like she was, she was thrilled about it for the rest of the day. She just wanted to see, like, hey, did you post the video yet? Who saw the video? Did anybody comment stuff like that? So she was, uh, she was really, she was really uh, digging, digging the whole uh, accomplishment that she was able to achieve yesterday. And then the other thing was, um, my son had his first track meet. He's in sixth grade now. He had his first track meet, which is really like the first really truly competitive thing he's been in right like he's played sports before obviously he's been in flag football and all this other stuff and like look i get it there are parents out there that are like oh well my 10 year old like like no like n- nobody has an elite 10 year old <laughs> like I- right. i'm sorry but like if you if your kids in fourth and fifth grade they're just having fun right like so sixth grade now he's competing against seventh and eighth graders and he, he goes out there and he runs the four by four now there are some very unique experiences in every sport, right? But that that last 100 of a 400 meter run is a very unique experience. It's it's one of those things that like unless you've done it, you don't know what it's like. 
And once you've done it, you have a common bond with everybody who's ever done it before, <laughs> right? Like it's just one of those yeah. common experiences that everybody shares. It's like, ooh, yeah, I, I know what it's like to have that monkey jump on his back. So I was trying to give him some tips. I was like, look, man, here's, here's what's going here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna be in a relay. Try to keep contact with the person in front of you. As soon as you get halfway through that back turn, um, you know, lay, lay it all out on the line. Leave nothing. Leave nothing in the tank. When you cross this finish line, you shouldn't be able to stand, right? And you know Marcelo. Marcelo is one of these kids that's like, everything's always come easy for him. And he's mm-hmm. never really had to dig deep to try to try hard because he's always pretty successful at like 75% effort. Right. So he gets the baton in the race yesterday, takes off, and, and like he was running with the B team because he's a sixth grader. So, you know, he's running with the B team, and now he's like in third place. So he's trying to catch second place. He takes off, and I'm like – Oh crap! He's he, he shot it, and he's he's yeah, not he's, gonna be he's able to fight die. through this. There's no oh, way. Oh like, no, he's, he's pacing this right. Yeah, I'm I'm watching him down the back the back straight away, and he's like, oh, okay, I can see it. He's starting to throttle down already, and then he did exactly what I told him to do. It was like one of the proudest moments I've ever had with him in particular <laughs> because I, again, like I know what it means to dig deep in that 400. It's not like anything else, and. He did it. He fought through. I, I watched him stride out that last 150, leave everything out on that track, almost pass out after that finish line, and I was so proud of him. I think he came in, uh, on, like I timed his split. He, he ran a 71 in his first Oof. meet ever as a sixth grader. So Oof. nothing nothing like he's not going to set any world records, but like for his first meet to ever go out there and just, just to see him push through that moment, it was such a it was such a, a, a proud like little achievement for me to see him do that. Yeah, and then and then what I did is like I I came home and I was like March like for the first time ever you inspired me to work out because we came home and it was like five thirty in the evening and usually I'm getting dinner ready I went out and I ran some hills right in front of my nice. house because I was like I can't have this kid beat me before he gets to high school like he's gonna beat me <laughs> you gotta, soon if you I gotta hang on for another, yeah. <laughs> another three years I gotta, I gotta at least get to high school before he beats me in a race right. You know, you are in control of when you can just be like, ah, I don't want to race today. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry, kid. Yeah. Go see if your brother wants to run. Give him a head start. (laughs) See if you can chase him down. Right, right, right. That's funny. So, so yeah, that was a, that was a fun moment to, to see him push through that. Um, it it was really cool to see him do that. Cause, cause like I said, he's not that type of person to just like give it his all. He's the type of person to, to try. And usually he's pretty successful trying it at 75%. Or he can, or he can backs off enough that he can be like ah well i didn't really try yeah exactly like, exactly like no it's nice it's nice to see you you know that's what it feels like and the, the reward uh, hopefully is something that continues to push him because like yeah. when you really give it out out and then you get that that satisfaction of it yeah. paying off like that's an addicting feeling like that that is the process coming to life 100 percent. i mean he and, and he felt it too right like so both him and Bree, oh i'm sure if he went out for a 400 he felt it there's there's feelings that he felt that he has never felt before well, I'm talking about that sense of accomplishment, right? Like that accomplishment that he had. I mean that too, but that. also there are feelings he felt that he has never felt before. Oh, I know. Like, like he he was like, "Is this supposed to feel like this? Is it supposed to feel like <laughs> something's biting you in the ass?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah. that's ex- you, you did it exactly right. You got booty lot. Congrats." Yeah, but so so between him and Bree last night at the dinner table, they were just bragging about themselves, and it was fun. It was fun to see because I would have paid to see. They had uh... earned it. They had earned it. Usually they brag about themselves. I'm like, man, shut up. Like y'all just always talk crap about yourselves but at that time i was actually like yeah you know what you deserve it you earned it today good job i would have paid to see milo's face at dinner but that's a that's a different story <laughs> for off the podcast um i do want to at some point um we're running a little long now uh we want to get to this interview with dan but i do want to maybe in a couple weeks dive into the idea of the multiple voices in your head programming because i have the same thing right like and not like to make light of people who actually have some kind of multiple voices in their head, but like the, the competing interests of functionality versus mobility versus lifting heavy shit versus like all these things that Chris has, has masterfully put in, uh, in these videos, um, on reels. Um, if you're not following along at trainer Gores, of course, at train with the best 21, I'm at Craig underscore Hoffman on Instagram, posting all kinds of stuff there. But like, I, I do think that's a really fun conversation of trying to balance those things within a workout. Um, and I do want to dive into that at some point soon. Uh, next week though, as we said, episode 200, make sure you're subscribed. You do not want to miss this one. We're going to a superstar 
like all star celebrity mailbag. We've already gotten questions submitted from Joel Sanders, from Yael Averbush. Uh, we've got Cam- uh, Michael Cummings sending his question already, and we've got ass out to a bunch of other people that are, that are going to be coming through with questions. So some of your favorites from the last literally 199 episodes going to be coming through with questions for us. Uh, so that'll be really fun. So if you're not subscribed, uh, make sure that you do that. Uh, other than that, that's it for uh, for this little little intro. When we get back, uh, Dan Grunfeld joins the pot here on the Train with the Best podcast. The Chairman with the Best podcast is brought to you by Super Coffee. Wait, that was a mug. Super Coffee comes in a bottle. Oh, no, 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 no. Au contraire. I mean, oh, yes, it comes in a bottle. That is how I usually enjoy my Super Coffee. I grab it and I go during the week, or I now have stocked the fridge at the Fit Collective with all kinds of Super Coffee goodies because I would like to not have to even think about my coffee in the morning. Just show up for a 7 a.m. session, run back to the fridge, and be like, voila, deliciousness. However, here as I record these advertisements on a Sunday morning, I wanted a nice cup of hot coffee. So I went into my pantry and I got some super coffee grounds. I also grabbed some super creamer and here I am drinking more delicious types of super product. All of that is available right now. And let's say even you're a Keurig person. They've got K-Cups too at drinksupercoffee.com. Use the code train with the best. You get 25% off your first order. That's train with the best at drinksupercoffee.com. I just, I just, literally clinked my coffee cup in the ad. I could tell you all kinds of cool stats, but it's delicious and I drink it every morning. What more do you want? Trade with the best. That's a that's a good endorsement. Trade with the best at drinksupercoffee.com. I'll get you 25% off. Save money, drink good coffee. The Train with the Best podcast is brought to you by Jaku and the Jaku Speed System. It is an app on your phone that pairs with a little Bluetooth device that you can either hold in your hand or put in a watch attachment so that you can get laser accurate timing anywhere. On a track, on a field, all you got to do is be able to set up your phone. It's that simple. No gates, no multi-thousand dollar timing system with lasers and stuff. I mean, lasers are cool and all, but you don't need them. It's 2022. We got Bluetooth now. So all you got to do is have your phone, load up the Jaku app, and you can do things like agility drills where you can get your splits across the same finish line multiple times. Let's see you do that with your fancy laser timing systems. You can't. That's what I thought. So how do you get this amazing system at what seems like, frankly, an absurd price? It's only a couple hundred bucks. You go to jaku.com slash discount slash TWTB as in train with the best. And that couple hundred bucks comes down even less. Yeah, that's a 20% discount at jaku.com slash discount slash TWTB. Check it all out at jaku.com or follow them on Instagram at jaku speed. Our guest today is the author of the book, By the Grace of the Game. Oh, look, it's the book, if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, it's By the Grace of the Game. I've always wanted to do that, like Jimmy Fallon style or, or Dave Letterman back in the day. Like, just right. hold up the book. Here it is. I'm Stephen Colbert. Uh, it's called By the Grace of the Game. The author is Dan Grunfeld. Uh, Dan and I actually talked about, what was it, Dan, like two months ago on the radio, and it was such a cool conversation because we hit on some things that you, you and I were texting after you're like, man, I can't believe you haven't actually read the book yet. Cause at that point, I don't even think it was out. It was launching and you, you hit on some things that were really central to the book, just in a conversation. I've now read the book and I, I'm excited to bring Dan onto the pod for a longer chat. So Dan, with that, welcome into the train with the best podcast. Awesome. Thanks so much. Guys. Good to be here. So for background on Dan, uh, his, the last name sounds familiar. His dad is Ernie Grunfeld. Uh, and the book is the story of his family. His grandparents who emigrated uh, from Europe uh, during the Holocaust or immediately after the Holocaust, after surviving the Holocaust as Jews in Europe. Uh, And then ultimately his dad's rise to an incredible basketball career, ultimately becoming an executive in the league. And it was funny, uh, Dan, because we, you know, our conversation, I was just honest up front. I was like, look, I'm a guy who does sports radio in Washington, D.C. And, you know, your dad made some moves that I didn't agree with. And so that's going to you know, invite in some criticism. Um, and I felt it would have been weird to not be upfront with that. And you're like, basically, once you read the book, you understand that a little bit of criticism about some basketball isn't a whole lot uh, for, for me or my dad. Um, but I'm curious, after now reading the book, when did that shift happen? Because you talk about in the book some of the sensitivities you had 
to the job that your dad had first as a player, then as an executive. And you didn't want to be seen as just like, Oh, I'm Ernie's kid. You know, this isn't handed to me. So I'm sure there are a variety of sensitivities of your own athletic career as a, as a rising basketball player that ultimately goes to Stanford and has a great career over in Europe. Um, and, and also the sensitivities that come with the papers that, like you said, you read as a kid, all those New York papers that were being critical of the, the job your dad was doing. When did that shift of, of understanding your family history and the story and letting that kind of criticism from doofuses like me with microphones kind of roll off your back. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm not sure it ever shifts so much as you just kind of, you become more mature, you have more experience. And I write very candidly in the book about growing up and my dad being the general manager of the Knicks. And so, you know, one week he'd be on the cover of the newspaper with a crown on his head. Cause he's the King of New York. Cause his moves are going great. And they've won five in a row. Then they lose four in a row, and two weeks later, he has a clown nose on. You know, so like you kind of realize that none of it's really true. And Craig, you know, you you read the book, you know what my dad's been through. You kind of know the family values of put your head down, work, don't really talk about it, do it. And so uh, that's kind of always the way I was raised. But listen, it's not to say that it's fun or pleasant. You know, everyone's a human being. So right. when you hear people, you know, being very critical, sometimes cruel, it's not like it's fun. But listen, if you if you run a professional sports franchise that comes with the territory, you know, that, that just kind of is the nature of, of the world and of the business. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to, as I, as I started taking notes and I started reading the book, um, one of the most powerful things, like there's obviously so many incredible stories in the book, but one of the most incredible ones for me personally was the, in the forward actually from Ray Allen talks about standing in this room in the Holocaust museum where he's looking around and like this entire village gets wiped out. And that to me was incredibly personable, personal, because I remember standing in that room in the Holocaust museum and thinking, Oh my God, these pictures look like the ones that hung on my grandparents wall. And so now having read the book, my question is not just like, what's it like to kind of understand that that truly was your family, but knowing that you had to research this book and that you had to talk to your grandmother and talk to your dad and talk to other family members about the most horrific experiences of their lives, what were those conversations like and how did you even begin to broach them that, that you wanted to peel back layers of this trauma that they had probably hidden away uh, for, at this point, you know, almost half a century? Yeah, my grandma was really my primary source as it relates to what happened during the Holocaust. I talked to family members in Budapest and in Israel, but you know, I talked, I did over a hundred hours of interviews with my grandma, recorded them, transcribed them. And you often find with Holocaust survivors, it's a binary. Either they don't want to talk about it, it's too painful, or they actually feel an obligation to. And my grandmother was in the latter camp. And so growing up, she always t told stories, talked about her relatives who were no longer with us. And by the way, my grandma lost five siblings and both parents in the Holocaust. And my grandfather lost his sisters and his parents. So he lost everyone. And as you know, from the book, my dad, we're talking about being an executive, being an NBA player. He's the only player in NBA history whose parents survived the Holocaust. You know, that's why my book is called By the Grace of the Game, you know, because it was really basketball that kind of gave my family this new future. But doing the research, understanding the story, writing the story, it was hard. You know, it was hard. Like, talking very honestly about what happened to my great grandparents in Auschwitz where they were killed. That's heavy and that's hard. But my grandma always says, just because stories are hard, doesn't mean you shouldn't tell them. And it's actually, we have to tell them, you know, because we need to make sure it never happens again to anybody. And so it was difficult. There were definitely difficult points, but uh, yeah, it was, it was my job to tell it. There was another story that I wanted to ask about, and it's kind of more fun the way it's portrayed in the book because uh, your dad gets to beat someone up. But um, yeah. <laughs> you know, the the idea of your dad finding his power, um, another you know tragedy, unfortunately, didn't leave your family in Europe. Um, you know, he comes over, and then his brother dies uh, tragically when they're they're teenagers. But he says, like, I want you to become this famous person. I want you to to achieve fame in America, and, and obviously, by the grace of the game, he finds it through basketball, right? Mm -hmm. So he has this moment where he, he gets in a scuffle with a, an older kid and eventually comes back and winds up beating this kid up years later, not to ruin the book. There's plenty more in the book. People should still read it and get it. <laughs> um, but like, as we start to shift the conversation a little bit to training and sports, et cetera, how did, how has the conversation evolved with your dad over year, over the years about sports, giving people power and specifically how it gave him power acceptance and, and ultimately the life that it's given him? No doubt. 
by the way, he didn't get to beat someone up. He chose to. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, but uh, listen, you know from the book, like we're talking about the Holocaust. Like there's some there's some heavy things, there's some dark things, but there's much more light in this story. It's ultimately hopeful. It's inspirational. My grandmother being the best example of that, but my dad also, you know, dealing with the tragedy when they came to the states with my uncle passing, and it was really. Basket. My dad found basketball at the playgrounds of New York City, and it took him away from all this tragedy and all this tra- trauma. So sports, basketball in so many ways was salvation for my dad. You know, and I think that's why he was such an incredible high school basketball player. You know, he was a good NBA player. He's very well known as an executive. People don't really know. He was a phenomenon as a high school basketball player. Mm-hmm. But when he got to the United States, he had never touched a basketball and he didn't speak a word of English. And I think it's because of losing his brother, because he was born from the ashes of the Holocaust, the game gave him such such salvation. And that's really where he did find his strength. And, you know, there's another story in the book where my when my grandparents see my dad play for the first time when he's in high school already. And my grandfather didn't even recognize him on the court. It would talk about transformation, right? Literally before the very eyes, sports allowed him to transform from, you know, an immigrant youth who was made fun of, who lost his brother to someone who now kind of you know, what was the powerful one. So in so many ways, yeah, basketball was just this incredible vehicle. And again, by the grace of the game. Yeah, I find that really, really interesting because you hear so many of these stories of, of people who have come from war torn countries or experiences like what your dad has come through. And, you know, I, I've always said that to make it to the level that you need to get to, whether it's the NBA, NFL or whatever, it's really not about talent. It's more about perseverance and resilience and obviously your dad is a story of that um and i like the way that you said that it's almost like he gets to be somebody else when he gets when he steps on the court and i can certainly relate to that you know like putting on a uniform it's almost like your your superhero costume you get to be this this alter ego um when when it's all said and done though like how does your dad go back to okay if he's not playing basketball anymore right because we we just had a, a chat with some some athletes who are now retired when that salvation is taken away how does he how does he manage that how does he how does he still find joy yeah it, it's a great question you know i know it of my, myself from having an eight-year professional career when the ball stops bouncing there's loss there there's healing there and i write about that in my book you know i didn't touch a ball for a year after i retired but of course i, I still would go back and forth with with it all and so for my dad he started working in basketball right after he retired. You know, he became a broadcaster, which is ironic because when he came to America and didn't speak English, he was denied admittance into certain schools because he didn't speak the language. And then when he retired as a player for the New York Knicks, the Knicks hired him to announce Knicks games on the radio. You know, so (laughs) it really is. It's such like a Cinderella story in so many ways. But I think that, you know, my dad was part of an NBA team for 42 straight seasons. You know, so luckily for him, he, he continued with that love uh, you know, that, that passion. And I think that, yeah, the game, you know, is such a big part of who he is, of his story. It brought him so much, but it also took him away from so much that, yeah, it's luckily he didn't have to deal with that after he stopped playing. And that's probably why he pursued a professional career in the game the way he did, because it just ha- meant so much to him and still does. I wanted to ask about your your similar reaction because you know you didn't work for an NBA team for 42 straight years. You you started to find towards the end of your career as you read about in the book these other things that started to pull at you. Um you were recently married and and you know you just had all these different things that seemed to start delighting you in a way that basketball wasn't anymore. So how did you deal with that? I'm also curious is I know you got you got kids now like cuz we talk about being parents to young athletes too knowing the experience that your dad had, knowing your own youth experience, and but now seeing how those two things played out in, into adulthood and how the careers went down different paths, um, how does that affect how you reflect on the end of your career and what you want to pass along to, to your kids ultimately? Yeah, so for me, yeah, it was it was a hard journey at the end of my career. And I write in my book, like I was, I was physically ill like at the end of my career because I was processing so much. You know, and you know, from the story, it wasn't, you know, I grew up around the NBA, there was pressure on me. Mostly, I put it on myself, right? But to Mm -hmm. to be great, because my dad was really good. But then there's also this bigger story that people didn't know, where it's like, you know, our, our, my relatives, they didn't get a chance to live out their dreams. So I had that weight on me as well, you know, so yeah, for all those reasons, there was so much to process at the end of my career. As I think about my kids and being a young athlete, I think one awesome thing about my dad and my parents is they never forced the game of basketball on me. And my dad was the first one to say like, Hey man, 
play basketball if you like it, play soccer if you like it, the arts, whatever it is, just find what you like and do it. And you know how it is with kids. Like you can't really tell them what to do. If you tell them, they'll probably do something else. I just think you have to make space for them to explore their interests. My parents did that for me. Basketball is what I wanted to do. I want to do that with my kids. I joked though, that being said, there is a little text basketball hoop in the living room. There are basketballs all over the house. If they would like to partake, they're more than welcome, <laughs> right? But, right? But like you have to just support them. And it's interesting when you talk about like youth, youth sports, because I, you know, I write about so honestly in the book about my struggles and the pressure and the expectation. It's interesting if you contrast that to my dad, right? Because he just got to America and it kind of relates to what we talked about earlier about basketball being salvation. He didn't have expectations. He didn't know where he was headed. He just played the game because it it brought him joy and it probably took him away from things. And I think that's why he was able to fly so high so fast. You know, he he wasn't kind of encumbered by any of those expectations. And so I know for me, when you talk about my kids, I want to make sure that they play the game because they love it and it's natural. And yeah, you should be motivated and you should be disciplined and determined. But there's always a law of diminishing returns and you want to yeah. find the point where that's no longer helpful. And I certainly surpassed that point, as you know, in the book, because I write about it, honestly. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you talk about that, that uh, the way that expectations kind of change everything, right? Because with expectations comes disappointment, right? Like if you're not expecting anything, then you can't ever be disappointed, I guess, right? Um, you went through something pretty traumatic, um, obviously not in, in, on the same sense that your, your grandparents went through and your family went through. But when you were a player at Stanford, if I'm correct, you, you had an ACL tear. Is that correct? That's right. So how, how did that, do you use your, like, obviously you said that you were carrying your family's history and nobody really knew about it. Do you use it as a chance to say, okay, this is, this is the thing that I have to go through. And I know that my family has dealt with this. So this is the adversity that I have to deal with, or is it something that minimizes it? Like how, how does it, how does it affect your comeback and your mentality in your comeback? Yeah. You know, I, I drew so much inspiration over the course of my life from knowing what my grandparents overcame, what my dad overcame. It gave me that sense of purpose and, you know, the, the possibilities in life. And so when I tore my ACL and keep in mind, I was the second leading scorer in the Pac-10. I was the most improved player in the country. I was like a few weeks away from being an NBA player and, and fulfilling my lifelong dream that went far deeper than me, as we mentioned, you know, so I was always fighting for this huge thing. So that injury was truly, truly crushing. And my grandmother, because she lives 25 minutes from Stanford's campus, so she came to every home game I played. She was she was sitting 20 feet away when I got hurt. And you know, I write in the book, I, I panicked. Of course, at first, I'm lying on the ground, writhing in agony. When I kind of came to my senses, she was kneeling down next to me, rubbing my head. You know, that's that's how close my grandmother was. And so we had dinner that night. And despite everything that she's been through, you know, she, I mean, what she's, what her eyes have seen, what she's experienced being on the brink of, of death dozens of times. I mean, she was saved during the war. I mean, it, it's just incredible what she went through. And I talk about it all in the book, but she always made space for me to mourn my disappointment. You know, it was never like, oh, if you only knew what I went through, you know, she right, said, right. No, this, this is a hard thing for you. But that being said, basketball is wins and losses. That was life and death. So for me, I do look at her and I do look at my dad, you know, be, you know, being fleeing his homeland as a refugee, coming to America, all those things like it gives you a sense of perspective. So I think it was healthy for me to to have the motivation and the inspiration, but also to have the perspective. You're also a fucking maniac. The training. <laughs> Thank you for that. The training. For that. <laughs> the training. This is a training podcast. This is probably the only interview you're ever going to be asked in this much detail about what you did afterwards. But Love the it. training that you did. After that ACL tear, and and I think you did some of it the summer before. Um, I I read you know that part of the book was was a little bit ago, so I'm not as fresh. But you you did some crazy stuff, man. Like, can you can you yep. tell our our training adjacent audience what you did on those sand hills and and let Chris just be horrified at the things that you put your body through? Yeah, w without a doubt. And so, uh, thank you for calling me a maniac because I take it as a compliment. But You're what welcome. that really You're means, welcome. right, is that I I was. I was motivated and determined and I would put the work in <laughs> that, that translates sure to did. <laughs> and I did that. Yeah, it was, it was extreme sure. in that way, but you know, th that's really what you're referring to is just being so motivated that you're willing to put yourself through a lot. And so I trained in on the, in the sand beaches of San Francisco with a guy named Frank, who, you know, I refer to the book lovingly as crazy Frank, cause that that's very apt. Uh, he gained notoriety after training me because he trained, 
real NBA stars like Gilbert Arenas and Blake Griffin. I was his first basketball player. And we just worked out together all day. He used to train people for the military and it shows, I mean, sunglasses, right. fisherman's hat, vest, he's got, you know, <laughs> boots. He calls every, every guy, sir. And he would, we were very close family friends. He moved out from New Jersey. He moved out to the Bay area when I got to Stanford. And he always said, he's like, dude, train with me. You don't know what you could, what you could be doing. And my team at Stanford, my sophomore year was number one in the country. I'm like, all right, Frank, whatever. <laughs> like I'm doing fine here. Believe me. But then I had a really tough year, my sophomore year. And I was like, you know, I need something more. And I was so motivated, like I said, because of this past, because of how much I wanted it. It's like, you know, I, ha I have to do something extreme. And so Frank, his training, it was physical, but it was also mental. You know, he would he would know how to push you to the brink, but also to test you mentally. And, you know, I write about in the book those things that we did. I mean, we would sprint this, the sand hills in San Francisco. I would I remember pulling sleds with people on them and carrying buckets <laughs> of sand and climbing <laughs> things and running backwards and forwards and. I tell a story in the book. He used to make me do these really long, heavy sand runs wearing a weight vest. And I mean, thick sand where you're like sinking in. And he'd say, all right, four trips up and down the beach. And it would take me like an hour and every step is painful. But and it's funny because we had some people come to try to train once. And I said, try to train because Frank says one in seven people don't show up for another session. But one of the athletes put in headphones to listen to music. Frank said, so what are you doing? Because I'm listening to music. He goes, not here. You're not. It's just you and the pain. Please go. You know, like yeah. that was the mentality, right? You got to feel it. And so when I did these, uh, these laps on the beach this one time, you know, I was struggling, but I remember just finishing. And as soon as I crossed, he goes, one more, sir. And I was like, you know, I was ready to choke him and I cursed at him, but he said, sir, one more, you'll see. And so I, I fought through it. I did it. And when I crossed the line, he said, don't forget that you did that because you didn't think you, you could do it. And now you did it. So now what, now, where are we going to push from here? It was that type of thing, just continuing to push physically, mentally. And I mentioned I was the most improved player in the country my, my, my junior year at Stanford. I went from averaging three and a half points to 18 points. And Frank was a big part of that. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Me, me and Craig had this conversation over the weekend about what, what the real purpose of school is, right? Like school isn't about learning. It's about learning how to learn, right? Yeah. And in a lot of ways, training isn't necessarily about the results that you get, but, you know, finding yourself and what you're willing to overcome and what you're willing to go through to achieve the things that you really want to achieve. It's, it's about motivation and discipline and things like that. And I remember early in my career, I would look at workouts like that and I'm like, man, this is crazy. Nobody should ever do this. And then I come back to it. And I'm like, actually, there's still some value in this workouts where you just have to find another self and dig deep and, and, and make it through. Um, but my follow up question to that is now that you're on the other side of those workouts, because I find myself here, too. Right. Like I know what it's like to go to the well. How do you work out now? Because you can't work out like that now anymore. <laughs> not not right? like that. <laughs> so, so it's like that's that's what I'm used to. That's what I know. I know I could work out that way. But if I do that, I'm going to end up like I'm going to end up hurting myself because I am a maniac and I'm not 20 years old anymore. Yeah, I, I keep that switch turned off. I was talking to my wife about this <laughs> recently, right? Where it's like, listen, I, I and I want, I was fighting for something then. I, I, I had a career and this passion with basketball, and that's what was driving me. But then I, you know, I had my career at Stanford. I had my professional career. Once it was over, my main objective was don't get hurt, you know, protect your body, stay fit. And so I, I don't push myself like that anymore. Not saying that that maniac gene isn't still there because it very much is, but that's why I, you know, I try to yeah. keep it calm and, uh, yeah, but I'm so grateful for that experience because I use it today and as a father in my professional career. I, I use those lessons. And one thing I'll say about Frank that was so genius about him, I'm I was talking about how much he pushed me and tested me, but he was the first one to pull me back too. I remember there was a day where we went to the gym and I, I, I was going so hard, but I was, I was tired, you know, and I was dragging. And I just remember like making a comment to him and we had like a two hour workout in front of us. And he said, sir, get your stuff. We're out of here. So what he goes, no, you're done. You're done for today. We'll hit it again tomorrow. You know, so it was, you can't be, you, you can't be all gas, no breaks. Right, right. You know what I mean? I, I'll tell you one other story about Frank, though, that, that I still use today. We used to do this drill where I would shoot a three-pointer from the top of the key. I would run and touch the baseline, then run and touch half court, then shoot another three-pointer. You know, so it's a little bit, you know, 15 right. seconds of running and shooting. If I made the shot, I would get plus one. If I missed it, I would get minus right. two. And Be I had to pro. get to a... Right. right. And I'd have to get yeah. to 11. So we would do it as like a warm up to start. You know, maybe it would take me 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. For whatever reason, one day I got to like, actually, I know what I got to. I got to negative 26. Right? So I was like, <laughs> like, I was just missing. I was like in a hole. 
and I remember, I, I still to this day can remember him saying, sir, I'm so happy this is happening. This is wonderful because you are going to get to 11. It might take you four or five hours, but you're not going to quit. You're going to get there. And when you're done, you're going to know you did it. And, and, and there's going to be that growth there. You know, and, dude, I was dragging, I was cursing. Yeah. He said, and after a half hour, I cut into it a little bit. Then I miss a couple. And it took me two hours. But I, but as soon as I hit that shot 11, he, we just picked up our stuff. He goes, see, told you. What's next? You know, so it's like, that's why I love like working out and what it could do for you and what Frank did for me, because those are the things that kind of push you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, especially that, that context too, of just, it's not just the old school, like, I'm going to just break you. It, it, it was with a purpose. It was, it had empathy to it. Um, yeah. as well. Have to. Yep. How and that's a pretty, that's a pretty popular game that beat the pro top of the key running back. Right. And plus one minus two, if you miss. So, uh, for, for all those who are out there, if you get to minus 26, don't give up, dude, <laughs> don't, don't. <laughs> let me tell you, another, let me, thank you for that. Let me tell you another thing. Frank always said, he's like, your mind will always give out before your, your body does. You could do it. It's just mentally. Can you stick with it? You know, so those are the things that like he, he pushed me and he tested me, but you're right. If you get to 90, uh, ne- negative 26, just head down, keep going. You'll get there. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. have faith. Listen, I could well, get to negative way, 26. I have faith in me. I could get to negative 26. <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to say, if you can't shoot, you might want to give up by the way, like, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but if you can shoot the basketball, keep going, you'll get there. <laughs> The Train with the Best podcast is brought to you by Momentus. And we had Patrick Dixon, the director of applied sports science on the podcast a few weeks ago to talk about collagen supplementation, which you've probably heard about for years. Talk about your hair, your nails. And maybe at this point, you've even heard about some of the benefits for joint health and tendon strength. Did you know that collagen supplementation can also help increase performance? Research out there has shown like, hey, in in using collagen daily for three weeks, it can actually help improve the rate of force production, meaning the power produced by the lower body. Again, hard research done by Keith Barr. It's been peer reviewed and published. Go check it out. That's why Momentus launched the all new collagen shot. They wanted to make it convenient and easy for athletes to get the right amount of collagen with the right cofactors to make sure that they can maximize that collagen synthesis. It comes in little packets. It's so easy to use. You literally just open the packet and take a shot of it. It's like a little piece of candy. It's delicious. It's easy to use. It is portable. It is all the things that typical collagen is not because it comes in a powder that makes your water bottles smell terrible that you probably want to mix with hot liquid. But as we also learned in that episode, not coffee. So why don't you just take these little packs instead? And why don't you set up a subscription order for them right now at livemomentous.com? Use the code train with the best 25. You'll get 25% off your first order and 15% off all of the refills. That's train with the best 25 at livemomentous.com. The Trend of the Best podcast is brought to you by BlazePod. BlazePod is the latest and greatest in reaction training, the official flash reflex training system. It is just a set of lights that can light up randomly. It can be programmed a certain way. It can be manually controlled all through an app on your phone. It is the best flash reflex training system out there. And we are so happy to partner with them and have them in the train with the best family. For me personally, the way I've been using them recently, warm ups. It's so great just to set out a couple, either whether I use one of the programs I created or one of the pre-programmed ones. And it's great for myself, my clients to get us moving, to get our brains turned on a little bit. And because it's just six lights per set, you can obviously buy a couple more. Uh, they're easy to set up, take down. They don't require any screwing in, turning on. You literally just open the app and boom, there you go. And then it takes four seconds to clean up. How quickly can you pick up six lights off the ground and put them back in the case? It's literally that easy. I should probably tell you the code so you can go get some. Go to blazepod.com. Use the code TWTB as in train with the best. TWTB It's 15% off right now at blazepod.com. Last thing uh, before we let you go here is we're running a little short on time, but the totality of all the things that we just talked about with athlete mentality, with the work ethic developed, with a little bit of that maniac complex, right? How has that then forayed into your post-playing life? Because you, you've you gone down some interesting avenues. You went to business school. You're, you're highly published as an author and a journalist. Like, How has the the training and the athlete mentality shaped you as a business and journalism professional? Big time. You know, though I think there's so much about sports, about athletics that is transferable. You know, the discipline, 
the teamwork, the collaboration. There's so many parts of it, but certainly, I mean, you mentioned I went to, went to business school. You know, there's a big test for that, the GMAT. And I approached it like I did hoops. I got up in the morning. I made a schedule. When, just when I thought I couldn't study more, I did, you know, and, and it worked for me. I did well. I got into Stanford again. Like, so I just applied what I learned as an athlete to, to that. And, and similarly now in my professional career, you know, having that, that discipline, that motivation, that, that work ethic, but also the communication skills. And, you know, I write very honestly in the book about like all that basketball did for me, all that sports did for me, you know, solving problems, communicating with people who are different than you, you know, maybe you don't agree with, right. That's what basketball is. It's just, it's a social experiment where you have to figure it out with people. Like all those things have translated so well to, to my life. And it just helped me, you know, they just helped me. Actual last question. If you could have Chris and I try one of your grandmother's dishes, what would it be? Oof. Uh, and we and we're short on time now. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> if I had asked this first, Chris, this would have been the entire interview. Yeah, seriously. Right. I, uh, you know from the book, I read a lot about my grandmother's cooking, Hungarian food. She's I'm the so best hungry in the reading world. the book. It was uh, yeah, unbelievably seriously. hungry. So By I way, actually she, had I had a chance to go to Budapest um, a few years ago, and I loved the food over there. It was it was it's incredible. Hungarian food is known as very good. My grandma turns ninety seven in June. She still is this in, incredible cook. I would have you guys eat rontatouche, which is like a breaded chicken, which I write about a lot in the book. And I would have you with a side of medlevesh, okay, which is sour cherry soup. So you're going to think that sounds gross. Like, what is that? Just I'm trust in. me. Come sit. Come sit. Let's eat it. You, you won't you, know, you won't be sorry. Deal. Done. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, the book, I get to do the Stephen Colbert thing again, by the grace of the game, uh, is out now. You can get it on Amazon and bookstores everywhere. Uh, Dan Grunfeld, thanks so much for coming on the Train with the Best podcast. Awesome, guys. Thanks so much for having me.